so hello everybody uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker uh, it's uh, dr utam singh uh, who uh, works in our institute utam did his uh, phd in uh, harish chanda institute in allahabad under the supervision of professor uh, arun kumar pati there then there he worked on topics of entanglement quantum coherence so uh, like he was very let's say, engaged in this topic, popular topic at the time, quantum coherence. Then Utam moved to Brussels when uh, he worked under, uh, as a postdoc under uh, Nicola Self, Self uh, uh, in, uh, on things like quantum thermodynamics, uh, uh, Gaussian quantum mechanics. He's a postdoc in the group of uh, Yarikovich now, but to, more, to my surprise, it appears that he's also interested in quantum computing and some oracle separations. Right, so uh, today he'll be telling, telling us about his rest, recent work on exactly this. I'm, I'm pardon. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm interested more in what uh, Utam is doing. But I, I'm talking about what Utam is doing. No, you said that I'm appear apparently interested in quantum computing, so I'm replying. No, 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 but I, I meant. I'm mostly mostly interested in what what I'm doing. So that's a joke. That's a joke. Okay, thanks, Eric, for coming uh, for dropping in. By the way, yeah, pleasure. Please, uh, Utam, it's a great pleasure to have you. The screen is yours. Thank you, Michael. I'm very thankful that you asked me to give a presentation of my recent work. This is about uh, computational complexity. And uh, we have known that there are a lot of efficient models of quantum or quantum or classical computation. For example, this could be like space efficient or minimally efficient computations or uh, for example, time efficient computations. So memory efficient computations are for example, log space computations or P space computation. And similarly, this time efficient are like problems in P or NP or BPP. And uh, the role of complexity theory was to find the relation between the efficient models of computation. And historically, it has not been easy. And uh, there are only a few relations among a plethora of efficient models of computation. And today's talk is about uh, finding a relation between two complexity classes which are hybrid, I mean, they involve both classical and quantum computation. And uh, we will try to find if they are related to each other or they can be separated. So this will be the talk of the topic, or this will be the topic of the talk. And uh, I'm not sure that to who knows how much, so to, talk, to keep the talk self-contained, I will first uh, define some complexity classes. Uh, so that when I say some names like BPP or BQP or something it remains clear. And after defining these classes, I will try to tell what, it, what was our motivation to study this problem. And then since the, the results are kind of very involved, so I will just give some proof ideas and some details. Uh, it will not be sufficient, it will be mostly like intuitive things. So I will follow the book by Barak, uh, Aurora and Barak to define these complexity classes. And uh, there could be many equivalent definitions. So here is one that uh, uh, I will be taking. So first I will define what are the complexity classes, BP time and PPP. So it looks ugly, but to bear with me that uh, if you have a computable function T and a language L, which is just a subset of all strings. Then we say that a, prob a probabilistic Turing machine M decides the language L in time Tn. If for every X, the machine halts in time T modulus of X step, regardless of its random choices. So the probabilistic Turing machine, uh, it involves uh, two transition functions instead of one and it chooses randomly. So regardless of choices that it makes, it should halt in time t mod modulus of x. And uh, the probability that the output of the machine is equal to the language must be greater than two thirds. So if these conditions are satisfied, then we will say that this probabilistic Turing machine M 
decides the language in time to n. So n is generally the, so the input size. And then the BP time TN complexity class is the class of languages which can be decided by PTM in the above sense in order in time O to the O of TN. And then the BPP will be just union of all the BP time classes with the polynomial in time. So in like simple words, the BPP is just class of the class of problems which can be decided by a probabilistic Turing machine in polynomial time within the bounded error. So the name is like bounded probabilistic polynomial time. So this boundedness comes from this two third factor. And this can be met to as close as one act with the amplification techniques of that. So two third is simplest uh, in the sense that it's a number rather than saying some order uh, one thing here. And like I said that these definitions are exactly in the book by Arora and Barak. Then the other thing is I'll talk about what is meant by quantum compute computation. And uh, here, so if, if you take a binary function from all strings to zero, one, and another computable function t, then we say that this f is computable in quantum time t. Yeah? First of all, if there is a polynomial time classical Turing machine, that on unity inputs outputs the description of quantum gates. It's f1 to ftn such that for every x, we can compute fx with probability at least two thirds with the following process. So the process of computation involves four steps or so. And if using those four steps, we can determine the value of function x, then we will say that uh, this problem is solved by a quantum computation in time t. And these steps are, we first initialize m qubit quantum register to state uh, this. So this is a n qubit state where x is uh, m qubit and this m is less than or equal to the runtime. So it cannot have more qubits than the runtime. And then since we know the description of these gates, we apply these gates one by one on this register. And then we measure the register and and say the outcome is y. So y is just like a classical probability distribution over all the bit strings. And then we output y1. So this y1 is the output of the first qubit and this is supposed to be the out, this is supposed to be equal to the value of f at a uh, given input. So if we do this and the probability of getting output y1 is bounded by two thirds, then we will say that uh, fx can be computed by quantum computation in time tn. Now, if that time is a polynomial in N, then this class becomes BQP. So BQP is class of all problems which can be solved in quantum polynomial time. And now I will introduce uh, some low depth uh, quantum circuits or low depth complexity classes. So first we need to define what is depth. So depth is, is the length of longest uh, directed path from input node to the output node. And if, uh, for example, here, that if you think of this circuit, it contains uh, D unitary circuits. And I'm assuming that each unitary circuit here is depth one. So, and this can contain a lot of uh, two qubit and one qubit gates in it, but the input and output node, uh, there is only just one path between input and output. And so this, this circuit is uh, called a D-depth quantum circuit. And if a problem is solved by this circuit, then we will say that this problem is in QNCD. So the set of all problems that can be solved by a D-depth quantum circuit is known as QNCD. And if D is log of N, then this is just called QNC. Uh, sorry, Uta. So do you bounce the size of Let's say auxiliary register here. Uh... Yes, yeah, so, uh, the the input uh, register should be always polynomial in n. 
So we so can it's always add. polynomial in, uh, in, yeah. in the size of the. Because mm -hmm. just very recently, there was some work that when you allow exponentially many qubits, you can actually realize any computation like in logarithmic. Yeah, yeah. So this ancilla side can also be resourced. And uh, mm -hmm. here we always mean that we, at the input, we al will always have polynomially many qubits. Mm -hmm. And just including as, ancilla. Uh, you, so you, okay, okay. And just, just maybe because we have some students in the, uh, in the all, do we? Yeah, we have some students. So the, the the gates are probably just standard universal one or two qubit gates. This is what the situation to consider, I imagine. Yes. So you can consider any set of universal gates here, and these these are like parallel implementation of one and two qubit gates. So what is important here is that you cannot have a stack of gates in this U one circuit, for example. You cannot have sequential one qubit and two qubit gate so that will make it def two sure sure i understand mm -hmm. and now if we also give oracular access to this sort of circuit then these unitaries can call oracles and uh, in, it looks like just the given city circuit but there's one important difference is that after last oracle call we also allow additional unitary for processing the oracle outcome so this given CDO will contain an additional unitary circuit that will process the output of this oracle. So this is first class. So this is a low depth quantum circuit or low depth complexity class. Um, sorry, can I have some follow some further questions? So yeah, uh, standard BQP that doesn't really depend on the choice of this universal gate set. Yeah. Right, because you can make those tricks that you transfer one gate into another with some like overhead, right? So mm -hmm. it, it would seem to me like since you really want to work with let's say you, you count here the, the depth, right? Which so so I would imagine that in principle different gate sets would give you different complex uh, classes of computation because you maybe kind of you cannot maybe make this recompilation tricks so easily if you are bound but to the depth. I mean I'm not so sure about that because this definition they do not talk about any particular universal set but they just say that uh, they are just depth once any circuit here and uh, if I want to solve uh, if I want to produce all the unitary gates here then it might matter that which class of universal mm -hmm. gates I'm taking and how much depth it is giving for a particular mm -hmm. arbitrary unitary. But here I'm not talking about realizing any unitary. So, mm -hmm. so for BQP, it is important that when you define a universal universal class, then you need to implement all possible unitaries. And there is no restriction on depth, actually, it's exponential. No, in BQ, uh, okay, wait, in BQP, it's not in not BQP, of, no. No, in BQP, you are, you are always bounded to be like polynomial, right? Yeah, so uh, there, there is only polynomial uh, sequence gates there, yes. Right. Sure. Okay, this, that was just, okay. Like, look, just, sorry, I, okay. Like, if you imagine you have depth five circuits in the sense of that you are describing. It would seem to me that it would uh, vary a lot if you allow, in a given layer, if you allow arbitrary two qubit gates between some neighboring qubits, mm -hmm. or you allow uh, just some basic gates. The power, the power that you have would like would depend on it. Yes, so that will be kind of kind of fine graining. So, which I'm not interested in this talk. That uh, I'm not sure. interested in if in a particular class of unities. So, you could take the I mean the biggest of all. So, whatever. Okay, you think so is the like I, I should maybe think that you do like single and two arbitrary single and two qubit gates. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I mean since. Uh, I mean, they will be like poly polynomially many, so you can do it in parallel, all of them. Mm -hmm. 
And so the next class is uh, this will be the focus of the talk. And this is this we call CQD. I mean, not call, but this is called CQD, where you can see that uh, we start with the classical algorithm. So you can think A1 as a DPP machine. And then it can call a DZF quantum circuit. So this is a QNCD circuit. And uh, depending on what QNCD circuit tells this classical BPP machine, it can choose what to do with it. So it can process the outcomes of this QNCD circuit and process it accordingly. And uh, this keeps on doing until polynomially many times. So this is a this is uh, these are so these steps are polynomial many. So M is like going to poly N. So this means that this class can call QNCD circuit polynomially many times. Right. And same, so this can be thought of as a BPP to the QNCD complexity class. So you have a BPP machine which can as a record call QNCD like polynomially many times. And uh, similarly, if we allow oracles here, then there will be two sort of oracles here. One will be classical oracles for classical BPP part, and then there will be like oracles for quantum part. So both will be allowed. And uh, these oracles can be accessed parallelly, like polynomially many times at each layer. Then oh, another well, class. Sorry, Uta, this is class. Okay. Yeah. So when you mentioned both classical and quantum oracles. Yeah. Uh, so is it like in, I don't know, in, in Groover's algorithm, when you, let's say, when you have just some function which is encoded by this O, mm -hmm. uh, and you have like classically, you can query it. Like uh, and you get some value, uh, but quantumly you you kind of query it in superposition, just like in Gruber. Yeah, uh, is it how I should? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so this classical algorithm part, they cannot apply this oracle in superposition, and they cannot even maintain it. So, so yeah, this is important point actually. So after after. I don't know how it is working. I want to go back. Yeah, so it is important here that uh, the, in this circuit, this B, this QNC D part, it does not retain any coherence after the first invocation. So everything is measured here. So uh, so even even after first step, even in this hybrid class, this A two will not have any quantum thing in it or it cannot take any quantum thing in it. So no coherence can be maintained after each step. And then, uh, then another class is uh, QCD, where, where we have a D depth quantum circuit, so you want to UD, but it can call BPP machines as oracles. So, we so after each layer it will call a classical algorithm and process the outcome of this quantum part and then depending on what it does it can apply the second layer so second layer will depend on advice from this uh, classical bpp machine and the other important thing is that it can maintain coherence across the layers so this u1 measures some part and then sends the data to classical BPP machine or process it. And uh, then depending on that, it decides uh, what is the next unitary, but it also keeps coherence from the previous one. So that's the main difference between, uh, not main difference, this is one of the differences that this QCD class can actually maintain coherence across full computation while security will lose coherence at each step of uh, classical computation. And this class uh, then can be thought uh, of as QNCD to the BPP. So this means that QNCD is the base class and BPPs are called as oracles. 
Similarly, we can again define this class with oracles that you have classical oracle here and then quantum oracle here. So these these will be the classes that will appear in the next part of the talk. And uh, our goal is to understand difference between uh, difference or similarity between these classes. Now I will come to the motivation uh, of uh, getting to these problems. First of all, why we define the, this QCD or CQD. So there is something called uh, twice just steering physics, which believes that uh, the class BPP it is strictly contained in BQP. So this is like quantum supremacy thing that uh, it's a strong belief, but uh, there are many attempts on proving this like by Google. In 2019, they claimed that they achieved supremacy, but it's not, uh, I mean, it's not testified that they did achieve uh, supremacy. So this is one of the biggest open problems in complexity theory to either prove or disprove this uh, belief. And uh, why do we believe this thing is because there are algorithms like PGF finding or integer factorization or discrete logarithm problems. These all admit a uh, solution in quantum efficient time or these problems are in BQP, but uh, they don't seem to have a classical efficient algorithm for it. You can, if you are like interested in what are other problems of this sort, then there's a whole Jew of uh, quantum algorithms by Stephen Jordan, where he lists uh, what is the best classical runtime for different problems and what is the runtime for quantum. So these problems are all in BQP. But later in 2000, there was a seminal result by Richard Cleave and John Ward Truers that uh, these problems are not only in BQP, but they can also be solved by quantum circuits of logarithmic depth. And it, uh, if we allow classical and quantum preprocessing. So, this means that uh, Cleve and Watros was saying that these problems are in the class BPP to the QNC. So, or QNC to the BPP. I mean, it just says that uh, you allow classical pre and post processing. It doesn't say at what time. So, you just need to call, you need to have just QNC circuit. And QNC is a, a log depth circuit. So we introduced QNC D, which was D depth circuit. If we take D to be log N, then this becomes just class QNC. Uh, sorry, sorry. Like just because this uh, uh, the CQ uh, had uh, like no coherence across uh, like yes. throughout the computation, does QC had coherence? Uh, throughout computation. Yeah. Uh, and now this Q and C is this class as before, but with the logarithmic depth. Yes, yeah, so it's, uh, it, it has coherence in it, but it has only depth log of n. Okay. And just to clarify, the space is fortunately or unfortunately uh, polynomial in the size of the problem, not logarithmic, <laughs> right? Just yes. the depth is logarithmic. Yes, depth is log. Yeah. Yes, Otherwise, we would have uh, solved it on a classical uh, computer, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Just okay. It's a bit like uh, just high level comment. It's a bit intriguing how kind of close those things are to classical, right? It, it seems like. Yeah. Uh, so after this result in 2006, then Josa came with a conjecture that. Uh, instead of having a general polynomial size circuit like BQP machine, you just have a quantum circuit of polylog depth and you allow classical pre and post processing. So, polylog depth is just like uh, you have log to the power depth. Or, in other words, he got conjecturing that uh, BQP is nothing but BPP to the QNC. So, you don't need to build a uh, like polynomial time quantum computer, it will be sufficient if you just have a QNC circuit. So this is interesting. And uh, in fact, like we saw that since we can interleave classical and quantum in two different ways, so the conjecture is more like proving that BQP is either QCD or CQD or both, 
where they, it's logarithmic now. So this is polylog. <laughs> Um, sorry, can you comment? I, I sort of, uh, this last implication, is it obvious or uh, like, should we follow the argument or is it the claim that is, the details are, are in this paper? Yeah. No, the, the, uh, the uh, Joseph's paper claims that one should have BQP equal to BPP to the QNC. But uh, since interleaving classical can be interleaving classical and quantum is in two different ways, so the conjecture can be very well made. Like so, this is another conjecture based on what Joseph was conjecturing. It does not follow from the argument. So instead, you saw BQP is QCD. Uh, sure. No, no. I I mean, my I guess my question was like. Assuming this conjecture that BQP equals to BPP to QNC, uh, yeah. does it follow uh, the second line? Does it follow this BQP equals QCD or BP, uh, like no? No. Does, so those are like other conjectures that are possible. I mean, the one BPP to the QNC is CQD circuit. So this is same. BP, BQP is CQD. These are the same thing. Mm -hmm. Right. QCD right. is different. Okay. Okay. And after this, I mean, around the same time, Scott Aronson come came with the, his ten semi grand challenges in quantum computing theory, and as one of the problems, he stated uh, uh, disproving the Joseph's conjecture and saying that the BQP is stronger than both of these classes. In other words, he posed the problem like a separation between BQP and these two hybrid models, QCD and CQD. So this was the question. And it was answered in 2020 by two separate independent works. And they are kind of very nice. And these are by Chia Chung and Lai, and independently by Kudrunda. Both appeared at the same time, and they both disproved the Joseph's conjecture that this is not true. And uh, they prove uh, Aronson's conjecture in this sense that they, they, they find the oracle pro oracular problem where they saw that the problem is in BQP with respect to this oracle, but it's neither in QCD nor in CQD. And moreover, they prove a hierarchy theorem between in between these classes themselves. It shows that a problem that the QC D prime can solve, the QC D circuit will not be able to solve if D prime is not equal to two D plus one. So different depth, different depth QC classes have different uh, computing power. So QC D two D plus one is, is strictly powerful than QC D. And same is true for CQP. So this these two classes, since they appear in this sort of work, uh, that they proved that BQP is neither equal to QCD or CQD with respect to Oracle. So we, it's natural that if these classes themselves are related, if QCD and CQD themselves are related. And uh, like it's uh, it's seen from the picture that they kind of seem to have similar sort of power that QCD and CQD. But if we look closely, like we discussed before, it seems QCD is weaker, in the sense that uh, the CQD algorithm can call polynomially many times QNCD circuit. So it can apply quantum computation for polynomially many times, while QCD just have the depth. So it seems like uh, CQD may be more powerful because it has more quantum computational power in it. So we just thought that can we pull some relation between them? For example, a separation. So okay, wait, wait. I, I'm a bit uh, okay. I'm, I'm a bit confused because this uh, QC class maintains yeah. coherence throughout the computation, right? And uh, yeah. like. In, in what sense? So, so is it the case that CQ class can call every, let's say, uh, circuit from QCD 
as a subroutine. No. Q, Q and CD. Uh, so, okay, QNCD. Can, can, uh, okay, can we be, can, right, like, because there are many, you know, this is yeah, this yeah. complexity, theoretic business, like, uh, like when there are many uh, abbreviations, right? So, sure. um, so, so let me just, just if, recall yeah. that QNC was, uh, QNCD was DDAP circuit and QCD was a, a DDAP circuit that can call Oracle many times, like DTP machine many times. Sure, I mean, like if it can call Oracle, then it, like you have to have a separate script Oracle, right? Or um, What? You said that it can call, it can call Oracle. Yes. Just, but those classes that you have in the site that they don't have oracles attached so i'm like a bit confused i'm also confused that uh... no sorry just uh just to maybe uh, say again so this qcd class is the class that let's say calls roughly uh it was QC. So it maintains coherence throughout the computation, but yeah. it can call some number of times, uh, uh, like in between the com computation on some right. qubits, uh, measurements of the qubits, and it can apply uh, polynomial classical computation in between, yeah. Yeah. right? And yeah. then you are allowed to do it d times roughly. Yeah. Yeah. While CQD class was a class in which you do uh, similar stuff, but you don't maintain coherence throughout the computation, but you measure all the qubits and then run some uh, uh, some polynomial time classical computation. Right? Yeah, but yes, and uh, I'm saying that in CQD, you can call this uh, d depth quantum circuit polynomially many times. Uh... Let me just go back. Uh, I see. I see. So here, if you look, then I can call. So I have just D layers of quantum circuit here. And I can call D times uh, D or D plus one times uh, classical subroutine. So here I'm trying to emphasize that it just have D layers of unit region. And uh, if I go here, yeah, that will work. So if I go here, then you can see that it can call this whole circuit. So this is the QNCD circuit. This can call this circuit like polynomially many times. Okay, I just, okay. Ah, uh, this part I lost. Uh, thank you, thank you, yeah. Okay. Because you have general M and M is poly, yeah, in this X. So, but this seems, I mean, this is not a proof, it seems, so it, first of all, we thought that they are similar, then we thought that uh, QCD seems weaker, but it's not, nothing is true, actually. So we asked this question, and we asked two sort of questions, that if, if we, were, we were interested in a relation between between these two classes. And we were also interested in a kind of hierarchy theorem. For example, if we can prove that QC1 is strictly weaker than QC3, for example. But what we were able to prove is that uh, these two hybrid models are incompatible. There is no relation between them. There are problems which one can solve, but not the other, and vice versa. And the uh, here are the results which might need a little explanation that what it means. So this first column is problems. So this is called D prime serial Simon's problem. I will introduce this. This is called D prime Suffolk collision to Simon's problem. And this is Suffolk Simon problem. So I will introduce these two because these are our work. And the, this column means that if you have a D prime SES problem, then QC D prime cannot solve it. It has to have D, plus, D prime plus one depth. So this is lower bound that 
this problem cannot be solved by qc d prime circuit on the other hand there is an upper bound also that if you allow def to be 2d prime plus 2 then this problem can be solved by qcd circuit while cqd can solve it in one step this problem and here we use a standard oracle and we sort the second problem is more difficult i will talk less about this this is the suffolk col col suffer collision to Simon's problem. And it says that a QC4 circuit can solve it. But a CQD circuit with depth less than or equal to D, D prime cannot solve it. But if you give it some more depth like D prime plus five, it can solve it. So this shows that there exist two problems, two oracular problems. One case, a QCD circuit fails to solve while CQD can. And in other case, QCD can solve, but uh, CQD fails. What was crucial is that we could not prove this uh, separation using the second problem using a standard oracle. We need to introduce a stochastic oracle. So this is our construction with next result weaker or stronger, I don't know. So, and these problems were introduced by Chia Chung Lai, who disproved the Jojas conjecture or proved uh, Aronson's conjecture. It says that this D prime SSP problem, QCD cannot solve, but QC 2D prime plus two can solve. Similarly, CQD can also not solve, but CQ 2D prime plus one can solve. So this is the problem. This problem is in BQP, but it's not in QCD or CQD. So that's the result. Now, since uh, all the very problems cool. Huh? very cool thank you well it required like one year for us like we played with a lot of problems so these are all variants of simon's problem that is why it was very cool also for us so i'll just introduce what is uh, introduced again because everybody knows about it but i will introduce uh, the simon's problem and uh, algorithm for it so Simon's problem is that you are given a two to one function uh, from n side string to n side string such that uh, gx prime plus s equal to gx. So it's a two to one function, and but it has periodicity as well. And the goal is to find s. So this is Simon's problem. And it can be very easily solved by this. So you start from uh, n qubits here and uh, nc large here. So they are still polynomial domain. And you apply Hadamard on the first qubit, first n qubits, and you will get the superposition over all strings. Then you call Oracle on the first register, and that will implement the function gx on it. Then you measure the second register here, and you will get some outcome y. And since it was two to one and satisfied this periodicity condition, the first register will become x and x plus s because they will both correspond to because gx and gx of x plus uh, s both are equal to same number so after measuring you will get a y and then uh, these two gets and you can call them as collisions so these are collisions giving same value of function and then you apply again the hadamard on the first qubit uh, i mean first in qubits and you will get this sort of expression here. So now again, you measure this, this part after applying Hadamard, and you see that this result will be non-zero only when s dot d is equal to zero. So you perform this many, many times. At each time, you will get an expression s dot d equal to zero, s dot, sorry, d dot s equal to zero, where d is arbitrary, d is random. Actually. So you measure, you don't know what d you will get, will get some d and you repeat this procedure polynomially many times, then you will get polynomially many equations of this form. And these equations can be solved efficiently using classical computers to determine s. So this is uh, Simon's algorithm. Now, if we just think, if you just talk about how much depth is needed. So this is depth one, so you applied Hadamard. So this is depth one. And then Oracle is uh, comes with the first depth, so this is okay. Then we measure. This is also included in depth one. Then you apply a Hadamard. 
and like we mentioned before, if we have an oracle, then we allow for extra layer of processing. So this Hadamard comes in extra layer, and then there's measurement. So this is actually in our language, this is the QNC1 circuit plus classical post-processing. So Simon's problem is actually in QNC1 plus post plus classical post-processing. And now we want to uh, make sorry, stupid question. Why you you said QNC1, not QC1? uh because i did not require any because this is just one time thing if if i needed another quantum computation after that then i would think of calling qc something sure sure but you might maybe i misheard because you might you said q and n in the middle and n yes, was referring yes, to the logarithmic depth if i remember right yes so what is logarithmic here well, no, no, I said QNC1, not QNC. So again, I'm sorry for confusion. So QNC with a subscript, if I say QNC1, it's depth one. If I just I say see. QNC1. Okay. So in other words, QNC1 is the same as QC1. Yes. Great. <laughs> okay, this is the confusion with, the, with those uh, context uh, classes names. Okay, thank you. So our goal now was to change this uh, this problem in such a way that uh, somehow QCD could not solve it, for example. So this is uh, this is where we define this uh, D serial Simon's problem, and this one is easy to state actually. It says that you sample D plus one random Simon function with periods SI. The problem is to find period SD of the last Simon function. So you, one can think that this is just collection of Simon's problems at this point. But uh, since we want a problem which QNCD cannot solve, so we need to, we need to make it in such a way that uh, it has to solve them sequentially. And this can be achieved very simply that uh, we allow access to the first function f0 directly, but the access to other Simon functions, they are not given directly. So you are defining an oracle, which will only output fix if input has known the period from the last function. So this means that uh, if I want to implement f1x, I need to know s0. And since I need to know S0, I need to apply one layer of quantum computation so that I can find the period. And once I find the period, then I can get access to F1. Then again, I need to find the period and I have to go keep on doing this. So, so my D depth in QN, QCD circuit will be spent in just finding these uh, periods. So we can only reach up to FD, but we cannot, we, we don't have any depth left to solve it. So this is how we impose this condition that QCD could not be able to solve it by imposing this serial thing in it that it need to- um, Sorry, uh, Utam, a naive question, because you, you kind of gave to us uh, Simon's algorithm, so, and it can be interpreted as like, okay, something in this, QC1 class, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, but now in what you are saying, you, uh, you you seem to suggest that if you have this kind of funny kind of structured problem when uh, like uh, the access to the next Simon problem, let's say is revealed only after, let's say you, you found the period, right? So, uh, Okay, so I mean, this is a statement of the problem, but uh, like, wh why, uh, what, uh, what is the argument that excludes that maybe some other clever circuits, circuit, you know, with, from this class solves your problem of small depth? Yes, uh, so this is just the intuition, this is not a proof. Okay, okay, okay. Sure, 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 sure. I mean, how long is your paper? Like 40, 50 pages or longer? It's 47 pages. 
<laughs> very good <laughs> so it just intuits us uh, because we were trying to build our own problems to impose this thing so we tweaked a lot and we did whatever it took so so yeah, at this I point it i understand the spirit like so it's like you kind of you are looking it's like in this business you seem to look for oracles that yes. have the properties that you desire somehow uh, exactly so this seems kind of very this seemed very generic to us after we realized these things that uh, these oracular problems are bad in some sense because i can make oracle as uh, bad or as uh, conspicuous as we want because these are still black boxes so what they give us we decide so i mean that is why these problems are ugly it's not nice like simon's problem because you are telling artificially that okay i, I want my oracle to have this property that property so it's not so nice after all so the intuition was this that since if we could somehow if we could somehow force this sequential thing into the problem then this might be a candidate problem where qcd could not be able to solve it and uh, first of all cq1 why cq1 could solve it it's easy because cq1 has access to polynomially many q and series circuits and it has classical post pro i mean pre classical post processing also so it can at one step it can call the his polynomially many q and series circuits to solve simon's problem and it can solve the last problem as well so it just take one step so this is very simple but why qcd cannot solve it if uh, it's a bit difficult but it's, it's still easier than the second problem so so like i said before that uh, this is still intuition that qcd has only d depth and all its depth is used to determine the period from zero to d minus one so it doesn't have any depth left to compute uh, the period of the last function so it can just know what is function, but it cannot find ST. And uh, the proof is uh, based on what is called O2H lemma. But like other things, I also need to define more language to define O2H lemma. So here it is that I define a unitary, which is based on some Oracle L and uh, some query domain S. So you have a unitary that acts on a query response and work register and you have an oracle l that acts on qr and s is a subset of query domain of l then the action of u l uh, subtracted f is given by you apply first the unitary then apply another unitary yes which i will define here and then apply the oracle and this extra us that sits there it just singles out if the query was made in S or not. So if the query was outside S, then it does nothing. But if query is inside the domain, then it uh, flips this uh, extra B register. So it's just an indicator function. It indicates that if query was in S or not. And then, sorry. Then we define an event find, which is an event that will tell you if the query was, if all the queries were made in, I mean, if, so find is the event when it says that the query was made in S. So this is the event. And if I compute the probability, which is simply just to you see when was the B register in get one state, then you will know that query was in S. So this is the probability of find. So this find is a event. So here, uh, what I'm trying to do here is that I'm trying to uh, somehow single out the domain part of the query is that uh, there is some domain part and I want to know if the query was made in that domain or not. And then O2H lemma comes and uh, uh, this is by this is a paper by Ambarnis and Tunru and Hamper. It's a very nice interpretation by this also very simple paper. So this is the premise of O2H lemma that you have an oracle L, you have an oracle L, 
that acts on QR and yes, it's some subset of query domain. And then you, if you have another Oracle G, which is called the Sado of L and Sado of L with respect to F. So there is a subset of query is fixed and you define a Sado with respect to this subset and Sado is just uh, identical to L except uh, inside the set S. So if you are outside the set S, then L and G both are the same. But if you are inside it, then G responds with perp, while L does not respond with perp. So L gives meaningful answer to those queries, but G gives garbage for those queries. And then O2H lemma says that if you apply a measurement PT on this set of circuits, so you have an ECL state row, you apply the unitary, you apply the L oracle and measure it and obtain some bit, bit string T. And now if you use uh, G instead of L, and again ask the, what is the probability of getting a string T, then the difference between these probabilities is actually bind, bounded by square root of two times the probability of finding this domain S. So remember this L and G, they were different at a subset of query domain S. And right hand side is just uh, the algorithm that will tell you how difficult it is to find this set S. So for example, if, uh, if this probability is small, so I have, uh, I have a subset of queries which are difficult to find in the full domain then this probability is close to zero. And this, then this will mean that uh, an algorithm with L or an algorithm with G, they are same. While you see that G does, G was not moving about S at all. So this tells you that uh, if two algorithms which are differing only at certain subset of queries, then if they are same or not will be determined by probability of finding that subset. So, I mean, it's easy to guess that what we will do here is that uh, we will try to hide the periods in such a way that they're difficult to find. Then we will claim that uh, this algorithm with actual oracles is close to the uh, algorithm with side odds. So that is our strategy that uh, we will claim that uh, using garbage oracles and using actual oracles, it's same in our problem. So, so these are our oracles in the beginning, they are actual oracles that will give you access to F in the same way that was described in the problem that uh, you need to know the periods first to access the function. And then we define uh, uh, sidos of L. So these MI are sidos of L and they act uh, identical to L uh, up to certain uh, certain eyes, but after I to D, they just uh, don't tell anything. They are garbage. This figure will be nice here. So we do we did two things. We first of all, so this let me just say that this E is the query part and S0 is the is the the period part. So what we are doing, we are first hiding this whole domain into a bigger domain. So for example, if this is two to the two n string set, then let's take it two to the three n or two to the four n. So first, first thing we did that we hit the, we hit the, the important domain in a big domain. And then what we did with it, when we introduced shadows with respect to these subsets, E cross S0 or E cross S1, we, we just replaced them with perp. So, so M1 does not know about uh, the, the, the relevant domain here. M2 knows this part, but not this part. And our goal is to show that if we replace L by these M1 to M2 D, the output of the algorithm will not change. So maybe I can spend some time here because this could be a very complicated thing. 
that uh, so i have a feeling that this might be a bit like if you want to dive it might be kind of over complicated i think uh, uh, yeah, like, so let's just uh, let's just say that uh, forget about this, and uh, I'm just telling that uh, how we try to prove it. So we had an actual QCD circuit, so it had applied U1, and then yeah, U1, then Oracle, then goes on to UD Oracle, and then it's final processing. And then we constructed another algorithm in which we replaced this L by Sidoj, and then just. Uh, using O2H lemma, we proved that uh, these two algorithms will answer the same string is negligibly small. So uh, these two algorithms are same, having actual oracles or sidoge. And then we already know that sidoge doesn't know about the period, so this is small itself. So in that sense, uh, it's because this, this quantity is small, this is also negligible. So probability of AL getting S is also negligible. So this was our proof technique that we applied O2H lemma, defined some shadows, and uh, proved that shadows and actual oracle, they are the same algorithms, then proved that this quantity is small. So I'm saying words, but uh, these will all require proof. So for example, proving this is negligible, proving this is also negligible. It seems negligible, but it still requires proof. So, that is why it was long only this thing but intuitively it is clear that so to wrap up this problem at least uh, we defined a problem where we tried to impose serial nature in the problem then we constructed sidos used o2s lemma to prove that sidos and actual records they are the same algorithm. and then they proved that the output the quantum algorithm will output s is negligibly small. So this means that uh, the QCD circuit will not be able to solve this problem or will not be able to find it. Actually, uh, if you see, I mean, I'm also a bit uh, carried away. So if you see this circuit, there is no classical processing here, okay? No, there is no. And uh, I just showed you this result that without classical processing, everything is fine. So this means that uh, until now, I just thought that QNCD cannot solve the problem. And I still need to conclude, I mean, include the classical computation in it. So classical computation will act as an advice. So I have to include it. And uh, that is like extra steps. But we thought that if we input classical advice as well in it, and then somehow we were able to claim that this classical advice is garbage as well. So this will also require proof that this classical advice that is given to a QCD circuit was with the overwhelmingly large probability was just wrong. So this means that uh, this did not help in solving it. So that was it. And uh, now the second problem is uh, much more complicated than the first one. It's uh, the fault collisions to Simon's problem. And probably, to, I mean, I can see that uh, it's like so boring. So I just state problem briefly. Yeah, but, so we sort of technically reach the limit of our time, but we are let's say, flexible always with time. So we have some more time, but maybe like if you can give more like high level overview. Yeah, right. So I just uh, maybe when I see that this circuit can solve it, then probably it's more understandable. But I'm showing that there's a problem DSCS, which will become clear in the algorithm itself. And I'm showing that a QC4 circuit can solve it. So I'll go fast that uh, you have uh, you have a query register in superposition, and then there are like extra registers. And now you call a stochastic oracle. What it does is that it picks a random y here in the r prime part and uh, gives uh, puts images here. So the, if it picked a y such that fx0 was fx1, then the zero it puts x0 with one it puts x1. And uh, so we measure r prime register here to learn y. I think it will not be a good idea because it's a complicated that I think I should stop and not tell this problem. 
uh, you know that it requires a lot of name again. So I, ha I have to define what is deep software. I need to define what is encrypted CS map and we just don't have time for it. So again, what I was so doing- Just maybe I, uh, I can say that, uh, let's say it's, it's clear that you guys did sort of uh, tremendous, like great work, although it's like, um, what like uh, like to really prove something in quantum computing like kind of uh, uh, like rigorously some like often a uh, lo lot of effort is needed <laughs> yeah right so let's just go to end and uh, after so these are our results and we are still interested in removing this stochastic method of the oracle or oracle altogether so like i said in the beginning that these results are not very nice from quantum computation perspective because they, these are oracular based and uh, this is something called relativizing world in quantum computation and these are not nice because changing the oracle will change the nature of the problem so i change the oracle and this if if one thing was contained in other it would reverse actually just by changing the oracle so it it's not uh, these results does not show that uh, indeed uh, having a log depth quantum circuit with classical pre and post processing will be equivalent to BQP. Even though they disproved it, but that was with respect to some oracle that was nasty to to design. So what is more interesting is just to instantiate these oracle. So this problem is very difficult, but that is where we are trying to proceed that uh, if we can try to remove this oracle and make it some instantiation here. So I'm sorry that I could not even finish the, the last one. So I should really think what I'm putting in my slides. <laughs> so, no, I, but uh, thank you so very I much. You I will not uh, take much time. Uh, good job, Utan. Still many, uh, many thanks. Uh, yes, for the great talk. Uh, we have time for questions and comments to, to the speaker. Yeah, I think I made it very boring for maybe next time I try better. <laughs> Certainly not for me. Uh, um, okay, I have a question. So just uh, just maybe clarify, because uh, I'm not that much in, into this like Oracle business. So there was like you mentioned this, uh, this conjecture uh, by Josa. Mm -hmm. uh, so is it now settled that uh, say BQP doesn't equal to BP to QNC? It's settled or, in the oracular world only. So it's settled that uh, oracularly, if you have oracle access to certain functions, then these problems are different. I see. I mean, so, but it still may be that without oracles, those are the same. Yeah, I mean, this will be like a dreamy thing. So if you could remove the Oracle and just prove that BQP is strictly larger than BQP to the QNC, then that would be like a very meaningful thing because sure. as long as this conjecture could be true, then the effort to make a full polynomial size quantum computer is worthless. We could not need it because you could uh, solve. Sure, sure. So can I just make a like a high level comment because uh, like you, you gave very kind of precise mathematical definitions like uh, of those uh, Q and C classes, C, Q, N classes, just uh, those are, you know, like maybe without oracles that are not that much physical, like in, in real life, but those are really the classes that are very interesting to that should be very interesting to people nowadays because of uh, uh, yeah. because of the sneeze regime, right? Uh, exactly. So, for example, this this class Q and C D. If you take uh, D to constant here, so if D is constant, so this is called Q and C zero class. I mean, again, there are a lot of names, but you just say that this is constant depth, and there was a paper by Koenig like. Uh, very recently in science that they just showed that if you had a classical circuit of this sort, this quantum one is strictly stronger. 
uh, right. So you refer maybe to like papers by Bravi. Yeah. Aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh. and those kind of funny games that they considered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sort of they but didn't really later. Some... Now they are now they are making more algorithms. But I was talking about a paper on eighteen, I think it was in science, and they they just showed that QNC zero is strictly stronger than NC zero. So. They mm -hmm. thought that if you have classical constant depth circuit and you have a quantum constant depth circuit, quantum is much stronger. So this is like wow. a direction in which you are trying to prove that BQP is strictly stronger than BPP, but in uh, like low depth classes. So which are meaningful. I mean, this could be tested. I don't know. They could. They, people can do experiments on that. I don't know if there mm -hmm. were experiments already, but. So, so these classes are really important, and uh, I mean, for us as a quantum information people, I mean, this could be like very interesting question, which is called gate synthesis or something. That uh, you have just the D depth, like you were interested in the beginning, that, right? and I'm asking you that how many unit phase are, what is the class of units that could gen that you could generate from it, right? So, or the states that you could create from these things. Like uh, if you want to take a random random one qubit, two qubit gates and have D depth, and uh, you just ask that what is the class of pure states that you will be able to. Generate. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. Okay, I have a bunch of further questions, but like I don't want to like, you know, other people in the audience, maybe hopefully might have some questions. Yarek was interested. So he exhibited interest at least in the beginning. No, as I said, I exhibited interest in what Zut I'm doing. Yeah, exactly. So yes, but I don't have further questions. I mean, I will ah, talk to okay. Talk to <laughs> so uh, I'll talk. To, I I will need uh, you know I will need a basic uh, crash course from the very fundamentals of quantum computing. So I will kindly ask Utam to do it privately for me. Okay, uh, so uh, okay, just following up uh, on yeah on this question about gates, okay, that are used in those classes. Can you just move to Simon problem, uh, Simon's problem again? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Okay. So technically speaking, okay, I'm just trying to pinpoint to those. Um, like question what gates are used in those classes because I'm looking at uh, okay that's why I needed the site I just see Hadamard Hadamard applied and some measurements right so yeah. in a sense one can just have a it's formally in the class one can formally define a class to kind of built from Hadamard gates and maybe computational basis measurements right and that's it, right? You don't need the full power of D. Okay, sorry, QCD. I have this DQC <laughs> stuff or the QC. Yeah, it was QCD, yeah, okay. Yeah, right? Yes. I so, mean, there are considerations of we, we all know that uh, this is interesting thing. For example, you just take Clifford circuits. So you are suggesting a problem in which you don't want to include all the gates, you want to include some gates, which is okay. And you can still define a class and you can, I mean, everything you have to do by yourself that uh, what is this class and what you can do with it. So for example, this Clifford class is very strong, even though it's not a universal thing, but you just apply Clifford gates and you could still like do a lot of things with it. Like It's strong, maybe once you start to add some oracles to it. <laughs> Right? Or because no, 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 no. I think, uh, I mean, I think in sense of uh, uh, priority L problems. So, yeah, so there are there are problems which the classical computation cannot solve, specifically with priority L problems. These are space bounded actually. And, but if you have a quantum computation, which is not fully quantum, it's just using Clifford circuits, and one knows that Clifford circuits can be simulated classically. And uh, then it could solve these problems. And they were not with Oracle, probably because of measurement. This, this, that was based on measurement based quantum computation. So 
even having a specific subset of unitaries could be interesting. So what you are asking could be very interesting that uh, maybe you could include other things like these are Hadamard is a single qubit get, so it must be very trivial. I mean, not trivial, but it must not be very interesting because it's a single sure. qubit get. Just maybe following up, like, but this, uh, this, the, this thing that you guys proved, like, though those are kind of nasty, I don't know, like, okay, I lost, I got lost in the details a bit, but like, is it also kind of the case that you can, like, when you have this class that solves those problems, this class actually also uses just had those had marks and no. like the same or it's more complicated no. it doesn't care what quantum gates we are using it just cares that it's just depth one so otherwise the result will not be stronger i will not claim what i claimed uh no, no I'm, I'm talking about like uh, because you have two 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 cases you have on one end kind of powerful and those are like non-trivial lower bounds for some mm -hmm. complexity class and this is where as far as i understood much of your effort went mm -hmm. right because this mm -hmm. other class had the power to kind of solve that problem in let's say one depth mm -hmm. one essentially mm -hmm. right so oh, right right so that yeah, yeah. class also essentially if i understand well just yeah, runs like solves a bunch of Simon's problems one after another, basically. This That's right, basically. actually. Uh, okay. Okay, so just okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Even in this case, also we did not use uh, any two qubit get all of Hadamard, even different. I mean, other problem like that. Okay, yeah, right. so there is some stuff we can discuss. Okay, it's I guess it's maybe a bit hermetic. I mean, okay, it's also hermetic for me, but interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, some further questions to Utam. I think this is a very interesting subject. Yeah, if you just look at the open problems, you will say, oh, this seems like easy thing, easy to state, but uh, it doesn't admit any didn't admit any solution yet. Lots of them are there. Okay, if there are no further questions, let's uh, thank Utam again for agreeing to like the, uh, to, to give this talk. Especially given that he gave another talk last week in our below in our colloquium, right? So it was a, quite some effort on his side. Thank you, Tom.